so I'm Maureen Babb. I'm a science librarian uh, at the University of Manitoba here. And I'm going to be presenting today in the Open Science series on predatory publishers. Uh, so what we're hoping to cover, or what I'm, I guess, there's no royal we, it's just me. Um, what I'm hoping to cover in uh, this presentation today is that you'll learn about the history of predatory publishing, that you'll identify the problems uh, that predatory publishing can cause within the academic literature, and you'll learn techniques to identify and avoid predatory journals, both in terms of not using content from them and in terms of not publishing in them. Um, so hopefully that's what you're here, here for. Um, so I'm going to start off with a quick poll. Uh, if you could take the time to answer, have you heard of predatory journals or predatory publishers before? And so I'll just wait until I've got some responses there. Okay, so I'm seeing some yeses and some I've heard of them, but I don't know uh, what, they, what the details are about them. So, uh, so it looks like there's some background information already, so that's good. Um, I'm going to close the poll now, and we will continue on. So that's good to know. Um, so in terms of what are predatory publishers, now over the years there have been different definitions given out, um, but in 2019 uh, the journal Nature published an article that was a consensus definition um, that was created based on a large group of people who had expertise in the area of predatory publishers and they sat down and hammered out something that fit the it was a definition that fit predatory journals that they were all comfortable with um, and so that definition is listed here predatory journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, and or use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. And if you read that article, which I've, I've put the citation for it there just underneath, um, you'll see that there are certain things that people going into it had expected would be in the definition, stuff about peer review, that's still relevant when talking about predatory journals but wasn't something that was easy to identify from the outside. Peer review is generally sort of secret. Um, you don't get to know who's doing the peer reviewing in most cases unless you're doing open peer review. Um, and so it's difficult to look at a journal and discern for sure if they're actually doing peer review, um, particularly if it you're just thinking of submitting somewhere and haven't actually submitted. So it's not something that outsiders can assess very easily. So this is the definition of, peer, of um, predatory journals, but it doesn't necessarily cover everything that should be considered when thinking about predatory journals. So in terms of the history of predatory publishing, uh, I'll start with sort of a basic background on the history of traditional publishing in which You'd, have a, you'd submit to a journal, the journal would publish for free, um, and then they would, the journals would sell the output, the actual finished journal, to libraries, to readers for a certain fee, and so that's where the money comes from. Um, and of course there's been a move towards open access, this idea that everybody should have access to the information, particularly if it's publicly funded, um, access to research and that sort of thing. So, then open access comes about, and open access is a very good thing, and, and I firmly agree with the idea that research should be accessible to people. But this sort of made an issue for uh, the, the traditional publishers, because all of a sudden, if you're releasing the information for free, you can't charge a subscription fee for access to it that defeats the purpose of open. So this changed the model around, so it becomes an author pays fee. And so the author pays upfront to publish in the journal. Um, and so this model, I, I think you can gather, is, is ripe for exploitation, right? Um, there's, you know, if you're buying something at the end, you're not going to pay for garbage. 
but if you're uh, if you're paying up front, well, there's there's more opportunity that you can be deceived, that you can be led astray. And so Jeffrey Beal, uh, in 2010, he's an American librarian, coined the term predatory publishing. And the term predatory publishing itself has had there have been debates over the validity of the term predatory publishing, if it's too divisive, but it's the one that everybody knows and it's the one that we've sort of stuck with at this point. Um, so in terms of, now peer review wasn't mentioned, as I said, in that definition, but it's something that people think about a lot when we think about predatory journals and it probably does play a major role. So peer review, of course, is the process during which a manuscript is sent to experts in the field of whatever that manuscript is in to solicit feedback. And then they give that feedback to the journal, the journal gives it back to the author, the author revises their work, and so on and so forth. Um, many predatory journals claim to undertake peer review, but often they'll, they'll say, you know, rapid peer review very fast in a, in a day, in a week. Um, which is, I used to say when I was doing this presentation that that's not enough time to do a peer review, a proper peer review, but as we've been going through this COVID situation, we've seen that in certain extraordinary circumstances, that can be enough time uh, to do a proper peer review, but in general, it's not. Um, and in general, people don't really have that incentive of, you know, a global pandemic to try and get through the peer review as quickly and as carefully as possible. Um, and so many predatory journals claim to undertake peer review. In some cases, it's obvious that they don't undertake peer review at all. In some cases, what they claim as peer review is just sort of a copy editing review where they'll change some of your words. And many of them will offer rapid peer reviews, often at higher prices. Um, and so acceptance can be within a week, or I've even read papers where acceptance can be within an hour. And I mean, even in the, the special situation of the COVID pandemic, um, peer review within an hour is completely unreasonable. <laughs> so, uh, so in terms of uh, predatory journals, then you th think about the quality of articles. And one of the questions that comes up is, well, what's in predatory journals? Um, and so in 2013, this guy, John Bohannon, uh, did a sting operation, basically. And he, su he wrote up a, a poor quality article, um, and he submitted it to 304 open access journals. And over half of them were accepted. And, and his take on this was that any genuine peer review would have caught absolutely glaring errors. So it, it looked like a legitimate paper, but it it wasn't. It, it wasn't real science in any way. So this sting operation led to meaningful change in uh, the directory of open access journals, which is one of the, the biggest uh, collections of open access resources. So open access, uh, the directory of open access journals is now much more um, careful about which journals it accepts. Um, but there's been a lot of criticism of the Bohannon sting. Like, the Bohannon in his paper says, you know, this demonstrates that these journals aren't serious, that they're not for real, that they don't take their, their scholarly duty seriously. Um, and other people have said, well, but you submitting this was functionally academic dishonesty. In, like a normal person isn't submitting a deliberately bad paper. Um, and so they say, well, whether or not you know, there's, there's debate about whether or not this is a valid way to assess journals. Um, also, there was no comparison. He didn't submit it to, uh, to non-open access journals to see how many of them accepted it. Um, and so since then, other studies have been done on the content in predatory journals, usually within a specific field. And so what does the quality look like when you're not submitting a deliberately bad article and saying, like, yeah, they accepted this, bad news? Um, so one of them that looked at nursing journals by Oerman and all in 2017, um, they found that the articles looked genuine at a glance, but when they took a closer look, they found that flawed research design was common. 
on 32.4% of journals. Um, and the articles themselves were of poor or average quality. And that plagiarized content was common in almost half of the, the articles that they sampled. Um, but again, they didn't compare to non-predatory, non-open access journals. And so there's still some criticism, but it does look like the quality is not great. Another study, the Mower and All 2017 that I've cited there, uh, suggests that the articles in them typically display bad reporting, bad methods, or both. Um, but I do think that it's important to note here that there can be quality content in these journals as well. Um, just because somebody submitted a paper to a bad journal doesn't mean that the paper itself is bad. Now this is important to consider as we look sort of at the the murkiness of the predatory journal situation. Um, and I'll get into it a little bit more. Um, but it probably means that they haven't had the same, the study, even if it's good, probably hasn't gone through the same rigorous process that, uh, that articles in more legitimate journals have. And this is something to bear in mind. Um, there's also, I'm going to talk briefly about a subspecies of predatory journals. Now, these are called hijacked journals, and they're almost, they're probably more deliberately predatory than your average predatory journals, because they're ones that take the name of a well-known journal, um, and then, you know, they'll change the word order of the title, or maybe they'll add, like, an international journal of such and such. So, if you've got the American Journal of Archaeology, maybe they'll change it around to the American Archaeological Journal, which may or may not be a real journal, I, I don't know off the top of my head, so don't assume that this, I'm just using it as an example. Um, so, yeah, but, but it, it creates this idea that, you know, they'll maybe fool people into submitting to them. Some of them even take the actual name, the American Journal of Archaeology, and just set up a dummy page, have authors submit, pay money, and then obviously your article is not published in the American Journal of Archaeology and you don't get the benefit of that and your work doesn't get out there. Um, so yeah, subspecies of predatory journals, hijacked journals, somebody pretending to be what they're not, a dog wearing Groucho Marx glasses, you know. Um, so in terms of another thing to consider that's become more and more of an issue, and I'm not going to spend too long on this, but there are predatory conferences as well. Um, these conferences will often send out, you know, invitations, just like you get with predatory journals, sending out invitations. Um, they're becoming increasingly a problem. It'll be interesting to see if that remains true after sort of the break of the pandemic. But oftentimes these will claim keynote speakers and other presenters that may or may not actually attend, um, that usually don't attend. They charge exorbitant fees. They're often in sort of, you know, um, vacation destinations, so Hawaii and places like that, um, places where people will want to go to to pay those exorbitant fees. And, and oftentimes um, there was one person who attended one and reported on it and said, you know, they, they promoted this as a conference in my area, but it turned out that there were about 10 different conferences they were running at the same time out of the same hotel and each one had about one speaker most of which were completely irrelevant to anything that I cared about and most of which were not of any sort of scholarly quality and I was just sitting there feeling like I wasted my money this this author says right and I've, I've noticed even in my own email that even though you can't go to ho holiday destinations right now and that sort of thing, that there have still been advertisements for predatory virtual conferences during uh, the COVID situation. So I'd, I'd be interested to see what those are like, but not interested enough to pay the money to do so. <laughs> so um, as we carry on, uh, so I mentioned this briefly, I would say that this is probably when people have sort of passing familiarity with predatory journals, probably the one thing they know about them is that they send spam. They will send emails to you over and over again, they'll be very flattering emails, they'll say, you know, you've seen your publication on this thing, we hope that you'll come and 
submit a, a journal to ours, and they all kind of look, you know, like this. Um, a lot of times they have weird greetings, Dear M. Maureen, uh, warm greetings, Honorable Dr. Maureen Babb, Dear Dr. Maureen Babb, greetings of the day. Dear Dr. M. Maureen, Dear Dr. Maureen Babb. You know, and these are all, they're, they're talking about all my, my wonderful contributions to a field that I have nothing to do with. Um, I, I have published in, you know, nursing journals and things like that, but I'm certainly not an expert, and anybody who was legitimately inviting experts to conferences would know that. Um, and you just keep getting more of them. This last one here is interesting because it's got all these, these like, oh, this is an approved journal. It's, it's part of this index, index Copernicus value of 5.72. It's got a scientific journal impact factor 2016 of 6.86 and all this sort of stuff. Those are all made up metrics. Um, there is a journal impact factor, and it's the only thing that is called impact factor. It's this journal impact factor. Um, all these other ones, index Copernicus value, uh, journal or scientific journal impact factor, these are all made up. And actually, there's like a weird little cottage industry of pretend impact factors where journals can pay money to get on to these fake indexes at higher ranks, right? So when they send out these emails, oh, I've got an index Copernicus value of of 5.72, well, maybe you paid for that ranking, or maybe you just say you have it and assume that nobody will check. But either way, the index Copernicus value isn't real. And one of the other things, of course, nobody, they're just, the journals are just scanning and pulling names and email addresses from wherever they can find them that have published in other uh, journal articles or in other journals. Um, and this is most obvious to me because I've published on the topic of predatory journals and I periodically get emails from predatory journals saying like, oh man, we loved your, your paper on predatory journals. We'd love you to submit to our own predatory journal because you're such an expert in the field. And usually the field that they're talking about is, you know, business administration or something that I have zero to do with. So, so yes. Um, if you get one of these emails, just delete them or, or save them to use in a presentation like I did. But don't respond to them. Don't submit to these journals. Um, it's not that legitimate journals never send out calls over email lists or anything like that or, or even will occasionally approach people individually. But things like this, no. No, these aren't. And the first time you get one, you might be flattered. You might think, wow, somebody's been reading my work. Wow, somebody thinks it's good quality. Wow, somebody wants me me to submit based on the work I've already done. And that can be really nice to hear, and particularly for, for newer researchers, it's a way that they can trap you and have you pay all this money um, to them and submit your work to their journal instead of to a legitimate one, which can cause real problems for you. Your work may not be able to be published elsewhere. It may not be able to be um, shared. It may be deleted. And of course, it won't be in a legitimate journal. Um, so yes, be wary of these emails. Just delete them. Honestly, report them as spam, maybe. Um, yeah. Um, so then the question becomes, well, who has published in predatory journals? And I would say that the vast majority of people who publish in predatory journals seem to have been people who have been feel, fooled, who saw those emails and who thought, wow, this seems like a good idea. Um, and they submit and they don't realize that it's a predatory journal. There are, however, people who publish in predatory journals knowing exactly what they are. Now, I would say, I suspect, and based on a couple of studies that have looked at motives, I would say that this is not the majority of people who submit to these journals, um, but they might do it for speed. Maybe they've got a, a tenure or tenure deadline or a job application deadline or a promotion deadline coming up, and they just need that one more presentation on their CV 
or one more publication on their CV, but they know that they won't have the time to get it in to a real journal before the deadline. So they submit to a predatory journal and hope nobody notices. Um, this is sort of a way of gaming the system. Maybe you look like you're really prolific because you've published in all these journals, but the stuff you're submitting isn't that good. You've submitted it to a journal that doesn't bother to vet anything. Um, you've submitted plagiarized content, who knows, right? But there's been evidence of that too. Um, there's people who submit because they've tried and submitted to other journals and they just got sick of it not being accepted, so they decided that it's better to go to a predatory journal than nowhere at all, or even if, because they know right from the outset that their work isn't strong enough to be published in a legitimate journal and decide they don't care and are going to publish anyways. There are also those with political or financial motivations. There's some evidence that um, certain pharmaceutical companies have published their work in uh, predatory journals because they get out, they get the results out faster, and because they get them out faster, then they're able to start making money off of their product earlier. Now, in that particular instance, when they they looked at pharmaceutical companies had that had done this, when they examined the studies, the studies seemed fine, right? But they'd gone with this predatory journal. So, um, and then there are a number of people who just don't see the problem with predatory journals at all, who think that a journal is a journal and it doesn't matter um, whether or not they're uh, working primarily for money or, or working for scientific effort. And many people will argue very legitimately that um, more legitimate publishers charge huge amounts of money for author processing fees or, or that are making huge amounts of money off of scholars, and this is true. But there's a difference in my mind between journals that want a lot of money but still value the quality of scholarship and journals that value money over the quality of scholarship. Um, so anyway, so this is who publishes in predatory journals. Again, the vast majority of them are just people who are victims, and that's why predatory journals have the name predatory journals. They are preying upon academics who are hoping to publish their work in a legitimate journal. Um, so what is the problem with predatory journals anyways? And there are a number of them. Um, one of the big ones is that it pollutes the, the scholarly literature with work that isn't held to a, a proper scholarly standard. Um, there's also the potential, if you're looking at those rare individuals who are using predatory journals to game the system, um, then you've basically got scholars that have dubious credentials that have gotten where they are with dubious work. And that's, that's not great. <laughs> um, one of the other things, uh, for, particularly for people who have been caught up and, and tricked by predatory journals, is that this can really damage their reputation, um, depending on how much an institution or hiring committee or something cares about uh, predatory journals and catches them, right? Like, you, you look like you haven't done your due diligence as a scholar if you publish in one of these journals. And, and also, you can be caught paying exorbitant fees that you didn't realize. Or you can realize later that, hey, this was a predatory journal and actually I want to publish it in a legitimate journal. But because you've published it somewhere else, you're no longer able to publish it in a more legitimate journal. And of course, these damage to reputation considerations can apply to people that cite predatory articles as well um, if they're basing conclusions off of them. And, and this can, of course, affect the quality of the work that has built on top of studies that are in predatory journals. Um, there's also a lack of permanence. Uh, academic, pro properly managed academic journals have a a policy and procedures for making sure that the content remains available um, for years and decades and centuries to come. Um, this is not true of predatory journals, and sometimes 
a predatory journal that existed last week will no longer exist and all the work that was put into it will no longer be there, will no longer be accessible for anybody to read. Um, and one of the other things is that because anybody can access the findings in, this, in these uh, predatory journals, um, as long as they're still up and haven't been removed, um, and they look like scholarly journal, uh, scholarly articles, especially to people who don't have a background in the area, um, this undermines the validity of research and scholarship in the public view because it, it allows people to find, you know, studies that maybe support whatever they believe but aren't backed by anything. And it, if people are aware that there's a whole sort of industry of scholarship that's just completely bogus and they don't understand the nuance of the situation and that this is something that, that um, scholarly organizations fight against, uh, then they'll say, well, you know, why should I trust this source but not this source sort of thing. So it, it, they, the big ones are really that they pollute the literature and they undermine the validity of scholarship and also that they have a chance to cause real damage to the people who end up submitting to them. Um, so then another question is, where is the problem of predatory journals? And in the past, there have been, there's been sort of a perception that this is a problem that is limited to developing nations, that it doesn't really matter in places like Canada and the United States and Britain and wherever. Um, and this has, this was never really based on anything. There have been studies that indicate that many of the predatory journals themselves are based out of, um, well, particularly India, but, but developing um, nations in general. Um, and, but in terms of who publishes in them, this perception that it's that it's only localized to the developing world or that it's only localized to brand new scholars um, upon exploration, upon study, this is proven to not be true. It's a global problem. People all over the world submit to predatory journals. People at all sorts of institutions submit to predatory journals. Um, people at all stages of their career submit to predatory journals. So it is truly a global problem and it is something that we need to think about. Um, so I talked about the idea of polluting the literature. So there are a couple of examples. Um, one that I'll talk about is this uh, freshwater ichthyology in India. Um, so apparently in ichthyology it's very important to have accurate names of fish in your in as, as you go through and do your taxonomy and that sort of thing. But I guess that some universities in India will give you a bonus if you publish an article naming a new fish or identifying a new fish or something like that. Um, and so people submit uh, to predatory journals and they say like, hey, I found this new fish. Um, but in fact, they've just renamed some fish that everybody already knew about. Um, and then this causes a problem not only because these scholars are, are being dishonest, but because when people are going back to do an analysis of all these different fish in the area, they end up coming across different names, names they haven't recognized. And they're like, oh, I better add that into my, my analysis. Um, even though it's actually describing, you know, it's fish B here, but it's actually describing fish A. Uh, that you've already got in your analysis. So apparently this has been a real issue in this particular field. Um, and you can check that out in that 2014 article, Predatory Journals in Indian Ichthyology. Um, and uh, so then there are other questions. Okay, so if, if this stuff is polluting the literature, well, is this stuff actually being cited or is it just being ignored? And so one study of um, biomedical journals in Nigeria found that most of the art, like that, the, on average, articles were being that were published in predatory journals were being cited 2.25 times each, right? So that is polluting the literature. Um, and then some other studies have suggested that in certain fields, 
the number of predatory journals is almost equivalent to the number of legitimate journals. Now, this is not common. I want to emphasize that. Most fields are not like that. But there are a few. Um, and, and all these are, are cited below, the, the studies that these are from. Um, and so this, this is a concern. It is polluting the literature in some areas more than others. It's causing a bigger problem in some areas than others. Um, but predatory journals are continuing to expand. They're continuing to grow. And so this is something that we need to be aware of. So, you know, if you take a look at this, um, could you tell the difference? Could you, just from glancing at a, a, a reference list, could you look at something and say, okay, well, which, one's, which one was published in a predatory journal or a probably predatory journal? Right? I mean, I know I couldn't. Um, this one, uh, oops, sorry, I've got it. This one is supposedly publi in a, published in a journal that has been alleged to be uh, predatory, right? And so, like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know the difference if you saw this on somebody's CV or if you saw it in a Google Scholar search, right? It looks just like anything else. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying, like, oh, yeah, we should, we should know just from a glance that this is a predatory journal. It's obviously unrealistic, right? So the, the problem has to be dealt with at a larger scale. Um, so then the question of, of damage, and I've talked a little bit about this already, um, but it can be detrimental. Publishing in predatory journals can be detrimental to the reputation of researchers who publish in them and or the institutions that um, uh, those people work at. Um, you can be, if you start your process and you end up partway through realizing, oh no, oh my gosh, this is a predatory journal. I don't want to be submitting here. I gotta, I, I gotta withdraw that paper. Well, a lot of these journals will ding you for a withdrawal fee, and sometimes they, even if you pay it, they won't uh, even remove the paper. But it's basically a form of extortion, right? Like, haha, we got you. Now we're gonna publish this anyway. Too bad for you. Give us fourteen hundred dollars, right? Um, and so, again, there's difficulty removing the items from journals, even if you never did agree to publish. Um, there's, and because, and I've pointed out that very legitimate studies can be submitted to these journals, there's a problem with the lack of um, permanent storage, the lack of um, permanent spaces for these, for this, the information that's housed in predatory journals, you, you have a real loss of scholarly information. And so you may have quality work, legitimately good quality work that becomes difficult or impossible to find. And again, undermines the credibility of science, potential for misuse um, by people, oh, I see I have a typo there, by people with finance, political or financial motivations. Um, so what's the reach, right? Um, we talked briefly about how many citations uh, these articles can get, but, but really what's, what's the danger here, right? And so Bohannon, the same guy, John Bohannon, he did another study in 2015 where he created a fake article along with the team um, where they pretended that they'd done this study and it showed that you know, that um, chocolate aids weight loss. Um, so this this was designed to have very sexy keywords and, and all this sort of thing, right? And they sent out a press release about it, and it got picked up by just a whole ton of, of media um, because, of course, everybody wants to know that eating chocolate will help you lose weight. I mean, that would be great, right? And, and I think I even remember seeing this story come up um, uh, on come up on, on my own news feeds. And, but of course it wasn't real. Um, but it got out there to the media. Um, the, and the media didn't, you know, they, they're not scholars themselves. They see a scholarly study. It looks like it's published in a legitimate journal. It looks good, right? Like, why not? Why can't we report on this? And so they do. Um, so the reach of predatory journals can be very broad, very far, um, if 
people are willing to put in the effort to do, say, press releases and, and interviews and things like that. Um, and, you know, besides that, this also clutters up, you know, when you do a search for a topic and there's just a whole bunch of noise, well, this adds, that's, that's irrelevant to what you're looking for, this adds more noise to that, more articles that, even if they're obviously bad, you still have to read through them to identify that they're obviously bad, as opposed to them having been caught as obviously bad and then not published in a scholarly journal, right? So, um, yeah, and then this is uh, the result. Um, after the, the sting off there, uh, John Bohannon published this thing that said, I fooled millions into thinking chocolate helps weight loss, and he details the process. And I've got the link there. Um, but I, I mentioned that I saw the, the initial chocolate story in the media. I never saw this follow-up, um, and I don't know how many other people did. Um, I've already talked about the possibility for political and financial motivations, so I won't go over it again. Um, so then the question is, well, what areas do predatory publishers target? Um, and Unfortunately, science seems to be the area that they target the most. Um, people who have done studies on the, the areas of predatory journals find that over 30% are in science, followed closely by medicine and health, technology and business. Um, in the original article, Nelson and Huffman in 2015, there was more description of, like, m more um, disciplines were analyzed than this, but these were the top. Um, so people in science and medicine and technology and business need to be extra careful about predatory journals and the existence of predatory journals. People in the humanities, not so much. Um, this is probably related to the fact that science and medicine and health tend to be, you know, well-funded and or better funded anyways. And humanities tends to often not be funded at all, so they don't tend to have the money that the predatory journals want, so why bother targeting them, right? That's, that's my assumption anyways. <laughs> um, so I've been talking about this, and when I've given this before, I've, I've had people approach me afterwards and say, you know, this is really scary. Um, and I want to take some time here to say that this, it's a problem, but it's not, you know, an all-consuming <laughs> huge problem that's going to destroy scholarship as we know it, at least not at this phase. Um, and it's certainly more of a problem in some disciplines than others. Um, and, but generally speaking, the overall number of predatory journals is low. It's very difficult to say what percentage of journals are predatory in comparison to non-predatory journals um, in the grand scheme of things because, because there are so many journals that you can't just go around and find out how many there are and then find out how many predatory journals there are and, and all this sort of thing. It's just, it's almost impossible to do. The one that I mentioned before where there was an area where potentially uh, the number of predatory journals was equivalent or equivalent-ish to the number of legitimate journals. This was looking within one specific um, database, right? So it was, you know, whether or not this was reflective of the field overall, don't know. So there are some estimates that say, you know, in this field, it's almost as many predatory journals as non-predatory journals. But in other fields, they're like, well, this is, you know, less than 1% of the journals out there. Um, and so the, it's more common that the numbers are low than that the numbers are very high predatory journals. But, um, so it's, it's, it's not that dire, you know, that's what I'm trying to get across here. It's bad, but it's not dire. <laughs> um, and even though the numbers but even though the numbers of predatory journals may be small, they can and do make their way into scholarly databases. Now, the number of predatory journals in scholarly databases, which is something that's easier to figure out, that tends to be very low. You know, 
1%, 2% of the absolute most, um, and in many cases, far below 1% of the number of journals in there. Um, but they are in there, and there are impacts of predatory journals beyond the simple number of them, which we've talked about through here, there's trust, there's money, there's reputation. Um, so we've gone through all of this. How do you avoid predatory journals? How do you avoid publishing in them? How do you avoid citing them? Um, so there, there are different techniques. There are lists of predatory journals. There are lists of approved journals. Um, there are checklists. Uh, the big one, critical assessment of information, whether you're looking at the journal on an individual level to figure out whether it's predatory, or whether you're looking at the article in the journal to trust whether it's worthwhile. Um, one of the things, you know, trust your spidey sense, um, but don't, don't give in to bias, right? Don't assume that a journal is predatory because um, it doesn't have the greatest English, for example, right? But do trust. So in terms of lists, there are some famous lists. Beale's list was the big one. Um, it's no longer maintained, and there were also issues with it, which I'll talk a little bit about. There's uh, Cabell's. Uh, Cabell has a list of potential predatory journals. Um, this is a subscription database. The University of Manitoba does not have a subscription to it, um, but maybe one of your colleagues at another institution does. Um, there are also lists of approved journals. Uh, the Directory of Open Access Journals tends to be a good place to look for open access journals, particularly now that they have um, such enhanced rigor after that Bohannon sting. Um, there's also a Cabell, Cabell's list of approved journals. And then you can look at curated databases like Medline. Now, as I mentioned, some predatory journals can and do get into databases. Um, but in general, curated databases, you know, somebody's taken the time to look at them um, and to put the resources that are in there in there. So I do want to take a moment to talk about lists. I mentioned that Beale's list was, uh, it was sort of the go-to list for a very long time. There are still mirroring sites that maintain and continue to update Beale's list, but it's no longer managed by Beale. Nobody knows who it's managed by at this point. Um, there's a real lack of transparency with it. Even when Beale was running it, he had criteria that he said were used to determine what goes on to, to the list, but he didn't go through each journal that he put on there individually and say why it was on there. Um, and so it wasn't always clear, and many journals that were on there, you know, rallied against being listed on there, and in some cases Beale did remove them, and in some cases he didn't. Um, there's also changing situations of uh, publishers. There was a situation a couple of years ago where two very well-known, um, well-respected, long-term uh, Canadian scholarly journals were purchased by a predatory publisher, and the content like a bunch of people quit because they realized what was happening. Um, but basically, you know, this, this journal used to be good and now it's not. There's been the reverse situation where things that used, journals that used to appear predatory have really cleaned up their act and are no longer predatory. So just because something was on a list at one point doesn't mean it's still valid for it to be on there. Um, there's a huge cost of maintenance if you want to do a list well. Um, Cabell's is trying, which is why it's a subscription database, um, but that means it's not accessible to everybody, right? Um, you have the chance of something getting on there accidentally. And the real, the real problem with lists is that what you're trying to do is you're trying to put, give a simple answer, is this predatory or is it not, to a complex question. Um, and I know that this isn't what anybody wants to hear, <laughs> but predatory journals are a spectrum. There are some predatory journals that are extremely predatory, and there are some predatory journals where maybe they're predatory or maybe they're just inexperienced, and you don't know, right? And you have to sort of work things out on an individual basis. Um, so what about these curated databases? What about places like PubMed? Um, well. PubMed is a database, but there's also ways that predatory journals can get into PubMed. 
Um, and one of the, the ways it's been documented is PubMed Central, which is used for researchers who have been given public funds in the United States to put their stuff up on PubMed. Um, but they can, any, maybe they've submitted to a predatory journal and then they post it to PubMed and then that journal is now, it appears as though it's in PubMed and so it's good and legitimate and been put there um, through a, um, a curating process as opposed to how it was really put there, which was because of this, this PubMed central sort of back door. Um, other databases, as I say, they're a better place to start, but there are a few predatory journals that seem to have snuck in. Scopus, for example, has been criticized for having predatory journals in there, and you can report potential predatory journals, but even if you do, um, and they'll do an analysis and they'll say, oh, okay, well, this, yeah, you were right to report, this is, does look predatory, we're going to stop accepting submissions from them. Great but they're not going to remove the submissions that were there before, right? So databases are a good place to start, but they're not flawless. So what can you do? You want to be careful, and you want to do things on a case-by-case -case basis. You want to do assessments. Um, there are tools available to help you. Think Check Submit um, for if you're thinking of submitting to a journal is a good place to start. There are checklists. Now, one of the things about checklists is that a lot of them are just sort of, they're not really based on anything. Um, there was a long period of time where predatory journals were discussed, but there were very few actual studies done on them. Um, real studies started being done on predatory journals in larger numbers in about 2017. So it's still only been about four years, even though uh, people had been talking about them since 2010. Um, so there are checklists. Some of them are better than others. Um, the one uh, which I'll show you on the next slide by uh, Dadka is probably the best one available right now. I suspect there will be better ones in the future, but this will give you a sense of what to look for. So if you take a look at the editorial section, um, you want to see, okay, well, what's the email of the editor? Is it an official email? Is it a general service email? or is there no email available? And you'll see that there's a wait for each of those. If it's an official email, good, that's not any points on the predatory scale. Um, if it's a general service email, so something like Yahoo uh, or Gmail, um, then that's one, it's maybe more of an issue, and if the email isn't available for the editor, well, that's a bigger red flag. And so each of these are weighted, and you'll get a score, and the score will be higher or lower based on these things in, in the editorial section, the review process and publishing, um, the announcement of information about the journal, and OA policies and publication charges. Um, and so what you'll get if you fill this out is not a yes, this journal is predatory, or no, this journal is not predatory. You will get a score. Um, and then you sort of need to decide whether you think this looks too iffy or if it looks OK, right? So for instance, a general service email, you know, they've flagged that as something, but in some countries, um, institutions uh, won't give, um, you know, like our emails here at umanitoba.ca, but that's not true in all countries, right? Um, you may have a very legitimate university, but they don't have their own um, email server in the same way. And so this is a, you know, maybe that's not as important as, okay, the unclear review process to you or, or the questionable special issue where it brings in all sorts of content from all sorts of irrelevant or unrelated fields and this sort of thing. Um, but this is probably the best checklist that's out there right now. Um, and if you're just doing a look through and, and you're, you're thinking of submitting, well, what are some red flags that you might see in a journal that might cause you to take a second look, right? Well, really low fees for authors. Um, so many of the journals for their author processing charges, they charge, in my opinion, way too much money, thousands of dollars, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars. But if you've got these really affordable fees that's often, that can often be 
a sign that you should take a closer look. Not necessarily a sign that it's predatory, but a sign that it might be. Um, overly broad uh, journal scope. So instead of being about, um, you know, um, archaeology, it's about social sciences and sciences or something like that. Um, the next one, I think, is probably the reddest of red flags, which is if you go to the journal website and the language on the journal website targets authors rather than readers of the journal, um, that's, that's a pretty good sign that it might be predatory and that you should take a closer look. Again, promises of rapid publication, particularly for additional fees. Um, and lack of information on retraction policies, manuscript handling, and data preservation. This is adapted from another article in Nature uh, by Moore in 2017. Um, so, you know, if you see these, take a closer look. Maybe you'll find out that actually the journal is not predatory. It's fine, but maybe not. Um, next slide. So basically the key takeaways from this are that predatory journals are a problem. Um, they're not a, a dire world-ending problem. Don't leave, please don't leave this webinar with that sense. Um, but they are something that you should be aware of and that you should pay attention to when you are looking at content in predatory journals and when, or when you are looking at content in journals and when you are considering submitting to a journal. Um, there are no simple answers. Um, assessment is your best precaution. Another precaution that I didn't really mention here but that I think is worthwhile is that if you're thinking of submitting to a journal, you're probably thinking of submitting in a field that you know pretty well because you've been doing research in that field. And if you, if you haven't heard of the journal, maybe there's a reason you haven't heard of the journal. Um, so, you know, you, you might want to consider journals that you've used studies from in the past um, that you know to be, you know, good quality, you found good studies in them. Maybe that's your place to start looking for a, a journal to submit to instead of saying like, oh, I'm just going to look up any old open access journal in this field and submit there, you know. Um, and yeah, there are red flags to watch out for, but no single flag absolutely indicates a predatory journal. And even when you've put a bunch of flags together, it's still a spectrum and you still have to make a judgment call at some point. Um, is this a predatory journal? Is it just a bad journal? If it's just a bad journal, do I want to submit to it anyways? Um, but yeah, predatory journals exist on a spectrum. 